All right, the Serena Williams tennis situation is a good learning lesson, not just for athletes, but for lawyers. And the moral of the story is, don't argue with your judge and expect to come out a winner. That's the hook. All right, so to lay the context, Serena Williams is playing Naomi Osaka in the finals of the US Open. She gets a warning for illegal coaching. Apparently in tennis, it's illegal for a coach to give hand signals or coaching to a player while the player is on the court. She gets a war, well, she gets a warning, no penalty, no nothing, and that is the beginning of the end for Serena. She begins fighting with the ref, unable to let it go. I don't have any code and I know you don't know that and I understand why you may have thought I, that was coaching but I'm telling you it's not, I don't cheat to win, I'd rather lose. But I can understand why you may have thought that but just know I, I, I never cheated. Later on in the game she smashes her racket which is an immediate code violation for racket abuse. Serena, Alina Dufresne, smash that one. Unable to let go of the initial warning of coaching. The fight with the ref escalates to the point where she calls him a thief. Yeah, it, she give her a hand signal. And now he gives her a third violation, which results in a game loss in the second set of the final. Uh, a rather harsh sanction for what was the third violation at the time, but nonetheless a third violation. The really amazing thing about this whole story is the manner in which Serena personalized the infraction or violations from the beginning, immediately jumping onto the fact that the umpire was impugning her dignity, her honesty, her character. Fast forward to the end of the match, the coach admitted that he was coaching or attempting to coach. Well, I mean, I'm honest, I was coaching. I mean, I don't think she looked at me, so that's why she didn't even think I was. But I was like 100% of the coaches on 100% of the matches. Yeah, I'll be honest, I was doing it. Everybody does it. It's a silly rule, they should do away with it. Now, that's not what Serena said. She denied it from the beginning, and I don't think she's lying. I don't think she necessarily saw the hand signals on that particular point. Everybody does it all the time. Whether or not they get busted is a separate issue. On this particular occasion, the coach saw it. The coach gave a warning, it should have ended there, but it didn't. All right, it's something that I see all the time in sports and I've never understood it. Why players continue to argue with the ref once the decision has already been made? Once the decision is made and written in stone, players and athletes continue to argue with the ref as though somehow they're gonna make the ref realize and come back on the decision and change it. It's not gonna happen. All that continuing to argue with the ref does is further irritate that ref and expose you to saying something that you might regret in the heat of the battle. What are you doing? It's bad training. Very bad training. Oh, look at that jaw, look at that jaw. All right, now, I am convinced that once Serena takes a step back and maybe watches the whole incident over, she's going to appreciate that she did in fact lose control and that she personalized the dispute with the umpire a lot more than it ought to have been personalized. And just as a side note, oh hey, how you doing? This umpire has also clashed with Rafael Nadal. In 2012, he gave Nadal two warnings for slow play and one warning for coaching on the court. So this is not necessarily a disagreement that ought to have been personalized the way it has been personalized. Here you go, let's go. I'll be back. Okay. An anecdote from my own career as a lawyer. I showed up to court one day. We had a hearing in front of a witness. And then when you have a hearing in front of a witness, you have to wear what we call in French a tuge. It's like a gown. And it comes with a little frock. A frock is the type of shirt and that little tie type thing that comes down. The shirts on which you put the frock don't have a regular collar. So it's not like you can wear a regular tie with them. You need that little frocky thing that comes in. So I show up to court and get in front of the judge to announce what we have to do, how long it's gonna take. We're not yet in front of the witness and I don't have my frock on. And then the judge sarcastically, ironically, chastisingly says to me, yeah, and uh, Maitre Freyhe, when you go back out there, find a tie. And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't have my frock yet because we're not yet in front of the witness, but I'll have it for the hearing. Now, if I wanted to personalize the debate, I could ask the judge, why are you saying this to me? There's 14 other people in here, yell at them too. And that's the issue when you personalize the debate, you shift from the what to the why. You shift from the what is the judge saying to why is the judge saying it to me. Is that a wasp? Stop it. 
And that is when you no longer discuss the issue, you discuss the motivation. It was a wasp. That is when you shift from discussing the issue to discussing the motivation, the underlying motivation as to why the judge would say this to me. You want to get out? Go. We're going to go to school now. Okay, go to the slide. If I wanted to get defensive in front of this judge, I could have come up with 15 reasons why the judge was picking on me and nobody else in that courtroom. Maybe he didn't like my face. Maybe he didn't like my father from a file they had 20 years ago and this was his way of getting revenge on my dad by picking on his son. Maybe he was addressing the rest of the courtroom by picking on me. It doesn't matter why he was saying it. The what was 100% accurate. I should have been wearing the frock regardless of what the 14 other lawyers were doing in the courtroom. And what good would it have done for me to fight with the judge? Let me give you a hint. A big, fat, nothing. Something you're gonna see a lot of as a lawyer, judges getting it wrong. Judges are nothing more than human. In law, there's an expression that says justice is human because at the end of the day, there's the law and there's the person interpreting the law and issuing a judgment. And that person is a human. They're gonna get it right sometimes, they're gonna get it wrong sometimes. I've had clients shrieking at me, the judge is wrong. Tell him he's wrong. We've argued our case. The judge has come to the judge's decision, agree with it or disagree with it. Judgment time is over. There's no more pleading now. The only thing I can do right now is fight with the judge instead of arguing before the judge. In in this case, incidentally, the judge wasn't wrong. In Serena's mind, he was wrong because she didn't see what he saw, but what he saw was actually correct, confirmed by her coach after the match. And it'll happen in law too. Sometimes your client is gonna be too heavily invested in the file, heavily invested in their own history in the file to appreciate that the judge actually might have just gotten it right and they were not right. That's the reality of law, much like living with the judge's decision is the reality of sports involving a judge. Incidentally, this is why I hate sports that involve a judge. I don't wanna rely on someone else's discretion to determine whether or not I'm right or one. I want objective, objective criteria. Another thing, I don't know the history of the rule about the no getting coaching from a coach in the middle of a match. Uh, a lot of people think it's a ridiculous, antiquated, useless rule that everyone breaks anyhow. A lot of people say that the breaking your racket is silly also. If you want to break your own racket, it's up to you if you want to do that. There are rules that constitute decorum, not just for the sake of decorum, but for safety as well. First of all, smashing your racket, yeah, it's your racket, smash it if you want. If you're on a grass court and you smash your racket like that, you'll damage the court. So beyond being a question of decorum, it's a question of making sure that a frustrated tennis player doesn't cause damage to the tennis court. But above and beyond causing material damage to the tennis court, it's a safety issue as well. I had a friend growing up who swung his racket in rage and hit himself in the face and broke his front tooth. Let me just flash to a clip of a guy swinging his racket and hitting the ball in rage and clocking the umpire in the face with the tennis ball. Right point. Immediate disqualification. No ifs, ands, ors, buts about it. Yes. <laughs> what is the takeaway from all of this? Justice is human. Judges are human. And you are going to have sticklers for judges. You're going to have pushovers for judges. And you have to know what you can get away with with which judge that you are allotted on a given day. As a lawyer, there are going to be days when you're going to want the complacent judge. And then there are going to be other days where you want the stickler for a judge. When opposing counsel is getting away with murder in the courtroom, <laughs> when opposing counsel is getting away with bending and breaking the rules and you have a complacent judge who's not bringing down the hammer on opposing counsel, you're gonna want the stickler who's gonna bring down the hammer and rein in some order on opposing counsel. That said, if you end up with a stickler and he's raining down the hammer on you, you're not necessarily gonna be all that happy that day, but that's the way the chips fall. You're stuck with the judge that you have. Fighting with the judge is not gonna get you anywhere. It's not gonna get the results that you want for yourself and it's not gonna get you the results that you want and need for your client. If you personalize the issue between you and the judge, you're gonna dig a deeper hole for yourself and you're gonna dig a hole so deep that you might not get out of it. Bringing it back to the tennis match, by all accounts Carlos Ramos is a stickler and he's a stickler with everybody and everybody knows that he's a stickler heading into the match. What do you do with that information? Do you get involved in a 15 minute heated exchange, personalize the disagreement with the judge after a call that actually had no impact on the match? You could if you want to exacerbate the situation. You can become convinced that the judge has it in for you for personal reasons and that would be the why the judge is saying it but it won't change what the judge is saying. And it takes a little bit of practice and it takes a little bit of callous to be able to back up and say the why is irrelevant to the what. You want to get up here? Oh. This applies to lawyers, but it ultimately applies to anybody else who has a judge that controls their fate to some degree. You can argue in front of the judge, you can even argue with the judge, but there is going to be a point in time at which arguing and fighting with the judge is going to accomplish not only nothing, it's going to have the opposite effect, move on, persevere.
Oh yeah, like, share, and subscribe. Every Thursday, Law Vlogs, we're gonna discuss something that's in the news, and I'm going to try to draw some lessons from that to the practice of law, as has been my experience in that practice for the 10 plus years that I dedicated my life to that. Peace out.